Hello, my name is Benjamin Hart. I'm an American attorney and the managing director of Integrity Legal here in Bangkok, Thailand. In this video, we're discussing specifically the K-1 and we're going to get into some specifics about IMBRA, the so-called um, International Marriage Broker Regulation Act, and things having to do with multiple filers of K-1s. Uh, the K-1 is something of an interesting travel document insofar as it's, it's a dual intent visa. So it, while it processes much like a non-immigrant visa, and in some cases processes significantly faster than spousal visas, um, it's also, for purposes of overall processing, treated as an immigrant visa, notwithstanding the fact that the K-1 is only issued for a 90-day period of validity for that person in the United States, Within that 90-day period, that individual needs to marry their American citizen fiancé and go ahead and adjust status to permanent residence. We talk about all of these matters in other videos on this channel. Specifically today, we're talking about some of the implications with respect to the International Marriage Broker Regulation Act. There are certain disclosures that were added as a result of this act um, that pertain to marriage brokers. And Ember kind of harkens back to a time uh, that's really kind of past, that sort of predates social media and some things like this, back to a time where there were situations where individuals from the United States would travel abroad, utilize the services of a so-called marriage broker, who would then put them in contact with interested and eligible counterparts to go ahead and sort of make a decision or ascertain whether or not there was a, there was a, there was a match there uh, to go ahead and get married. And it seems like Congress determined that there might have been some issues uh, with respect to things like abuse and possibly, I think, trafficking was, was probably thought of when they were, when they were uh, essentially debating this legislation and going ahead and promulgating it. And it was determined that in circumstances where a marriage broker specifically was utilized in creating the match, um, that needs to be that needs to be disclosed uh, with respect to a K-1 application. Basically, the state wants to make sure that there's no elements. It seems to me the state wants to make sure that there's no elements of, uh, for lack of a better term, sort of force or, or you know, everybody has to be entering into the situation with their eyes open. There's no elements of coercion or anything like this involved. Um, another thing that sort of runs in parallel with things like IMBRA is the issue of multiple filings. There was a time, I can actually remember long ago, 15, maybe 20 years from the time of this filming, I remember there was like a, a 2020 piece or something, like 60 minutes or something, talking about, you know, way back that, you know, there were these people that would go abroad and just constantly be filing for K-1 visas to the United States. Now, I'm sure, as with many things that happen in the sensationalized press, they took like two or three cases and then just sort of held them up as, wow, is this the standard? And it really wasn't the standard. Um, but, but it became sort of a cause celebre in that moment that, you know, something needed to be done with respect to like the notion of infinitely filing for infinite K-1s uh, for infinite numbers of quote unquote fiancés. Uh, it also, you know, the old rules where it was possible to not, it's still, I guess, possible to apply for any number of K-1s, but there are now um, disclosure requirements, and there are now, there's now hard, harsher scrutiny placed on uh, multiple filers. Uh, waivers need to be obtained with respect to certain kinds of multiple filers, and to get into the specifics of how the waiver works and things like that, that's, that's a discussion for a different day. What, what should be gained from this video is if one utilizes a marriage broker or if one has utilized a, or if one has filed for multiple K-1s in the past, even, even just one K-1 in the past, depending on the circumstances, it's definitely a good idea to contact uh, legal professionals who deal with immigration frequently in order to deal with the issue of a filing waiver or an Ember waiver uh, with respect to the underlying petition, as failing to do so can delay or even result in overall denial of, of a petition, depending on the circumstances. Again, just sort of going back to what the anecdote I was saying, like there was in the past this sort of notion that the K-1 category seemed a little lax, and so they came in and basically said, "Look, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and have more heavily scrutinize multiple filers for K-1s, and then at the same time, um, there there is a waiver requirement now with respect to multiple filers of K-1s, which was all of that was sort of implemented in an effort to." 
tighten up the overall category, for lack of a better term. The, the upshot of all of this, and in my opinion, again, is if any of these issues are present in a given case, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and contact a legal professional and ascertain whether or not, um, one, what the situation is within the specific case, and if this is a, this is a surmountable obstacle uh, with respect to the overall process.